Hey everybody, it's Pastor Mike, and I want to say thank you for joining us today at LifePoint Church. We believe Sundays are an opportunity for you to know God. We also believe small groups, the best thing we do, are your opportunity to find freedom. For more information, including locations, service times, which small groups to participate in, please visit our website at lifepointchurch.tv. My prayer for you as you listen to our message today is to encourage you and to help you take your next step to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Let's jump right into the message. Hey, well, I want to pray over the beginning of our service today. I'm very excited about the talk that I'm going to give. In fact, I'm going to out preach my notes and I'm going to end on time. Can I hear an amen from everyone who picks up kids between services? But I want to pray over you and I want to pray that we receive a word from God today And here's what I don't want. I don't want you to just grow in information. I want us to be radically transformed by the priest's word of God today. Romans 12, two says that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, that our thoughts and our our beliefs and our, our thinking is totally renovated and changed, okay? And that's what I want for us today. So would you join me in prayer as we start our message time together? Lord, we love you and we love your word and we love Jesus and we thank you, Lord God, that you are good to us. And we pray right now that you would open our hearts and our ears, give us ears to hear what the spirit of the Lord is speaking to our church today. And God, we receive by faith what you would give us by your implanted word, that it would plant and grow roots deep into who we are, into our lives. And Lord, change us forever by your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, today we're in week two of our What We Believe series. Last week, we got to hear one of our first, uh, the first message of the series, it's one of our four essential beliefs that the Bible is true. How many of you thankful for Pastor Dino Rizzo bringing the word last week? I was blessed by that. Honestly, I was a little jealous because I feel like I could talk for a day straight without a water break about the Bible and about today's message. You're going to you're going to feel that I'm, I've got way more notes in my head and on paper than I'm going to be able to preach today. But Pastor Dino did a great job challenging us to to respect the word, to honor the word, but also to read it, to review it, and to let your lives reflect a life in the word. And so uh, thankful to him. And today we are going into the second message of our series. This whole series is designed to be a small group catalyst. We want every one of you to be involved in small groups in our church anyway. And we've designed this series to be a conversation starter. So every week of the series, there's on our website, uh, there's information about hosting a group, joining a small group, and ultimately having a discussion as a small group, whether it's with other people in the church or even with your family. So we have some videos created uh, that we've made for you and also some discussion discussion points from the messages. And so I encourage all of you to join in small group discussing these four beliefs. And today we're looking at the message, we believe that Jesus is God. Can I hear an amen from the church today? Jesus is God. Let me ask you, have you ever met someone who you really anticipated to be one way. And then once you met him or her, you realize they're a different person than you expected. There's an old quote that says, you should never meet your heroes. And the the fear behind that quote is that you're usually disappointed in meeting your heroes because honestly, they're normal humans who, you know, go to the bathroom and put their pants one leg on at a time, right? But um, I heard another quote that said, whoever said never meet your heroes obviously had the wrong heroes. I've gotten the privilege of meeting a few uh, celebrities and heroes in my lifetime, and sometimes it's really encouraging, sometimes it's been pretty disappointing. When I was 18 years old, uh, I met a a celebrity that I was really excited about, and I just want to tell the story because it's stupid, but um, I was coming back from a missions trip to Trinidad, I was a baby Christian, and I get on the plane in Miami, and we flew from Trinidad to Miami, Miami to Houston, and I got on the plane in Miami, and I sit down next to this lady, and she's just jittery, she goes, do you know who's on the plane? I go, we are. She didn't catch the joke. Anyway, she was really excited. She goes, Terry Bradshaw is on the plane. Now, if you lived in the 90s and 2000s, you know who I'm talking about or before. If not, you can Google him. Terry Bradshaw was a Hall of Fame NFL quarterback and he was a sports commentator. And he's really known for his crazy talk and his voice and, you know, his stupid jokes. And, and at that time, he was really popular on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. He was on there like every other month, it felt like, right? So I said, well, go meet him. She goes, I can never meet Terry Bradshaw. Are you kidding, Terry Bradshaw? I said, go up there and meet the guy. She said, no, never. I was like, I'll go meet him. I, stupid, okay, I didn't care. So I walked up to first class, first time, uh, hanging out up there. I was like, can I get some orange juice, please? Thank you very much. I walked up to first class, I tap him on the shoulder. Mr. Bradshaw, he pops around, he was reading a book. I don't know if some of y'all know what that is, old school, before screens. 
and phones. He had a book in his hand and he turns around and he says, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I said, hey, uh, Mr. Bradshaw, my name's Mike Burnett and I thought you might like to meet me. And I really said that to him <laughs> and it was stupid. Anyway, he looked at me kind of with that delayed reaction and he goes, I would like to meet you. And he stood up and shook my hand. Anyway, I said, hey, have a great flight. You know, people heard you're on the plane. I, I, sometimes you meet people and they're just as cool as you thought they would be. Other times you meet folks and they disappoint and I won't tell any of those stories. But what about when you meet Jesus? What about when you meet the Lord? Did your expectations, were your expectations met or exceeded? Let me just say this. I truly believe with all of my heart that meeting Jesus will always exceed your expectations. It will always overwhelm you. It will always make you go, wow, he's better than I thought. And I'm not talking about meeting religion. I'm not talking about meeting a brand of Jesus and I'm not talking about meeting Jesus's people. I had a conversation with somebody one time who was not interested in church, not interested in Christianity, talking to me in their home. And I'm like, you know what I do for a living, right? And, and I said to this person, I said, you know, unfortunately, I think, I think your view of Christ is skewed because all you've met is his people and not Christ. You've met his church, but not him. You've, you've met the rules associated with religion but I wanna ask you the question, like, what does it look like to actually meet Christ and to know Christ? I'm just gonna tell you, I could literally talk for hours up here about Jesus Christ, and here's why. I deeply love Jesus. I've totally committed my whole life to him. I tell the Lord I serve at his pleasure. I only work here because he has me here. I don't work for you, I work for him. I'm on assignment, I'm under his lead. I'm trying my very best and I don't get it right all the time to be a fully devoted follower of Christ Jesus. He is my Lord, my savior, my best friend, my king, my boss. He's the highest affection I have. I love him more than my wife and my kids. I love him more than you. I love him more than anything ever in the whole wide world. And I want us to have a high view of Jesus. Our perceptions of Jesus from around the world and around our culture are low. We've made him too human. We've made him our homeboy. We've made him a one of us. We've made him just like us. But I wanna challenge us to let the scripture build our view of Jesus. We established last week, we believe the Bible is true and alive and active. Am I right, everyone? And so today, I wanna challenge us to meet Jesus of the Bible not Jesus of our culture. In fact, I have a picture I wanna show you of just different images of Jesus we've created. I mean, pick your version of Jesus, right? He's political Jesus. We got gay Jesus, straight Jesus, white Jesus, black Jesus, affirming Jesus, cartoon Jesus. We got Middle East Jesus. We got Chicago Jesus. We've got all these different versions of Jesus that we've created in our culture. And we make statements like, Jesus is whoever you want him to be in your heart. <laughs> We've made him soft, we've made him weak, we've made him passive, we've made him super accepting and tolerant, we've made him our homeboy. He's the never pushy friend who doesn't require anything of you. He's the get out of jail free card. Thomas Jefferson famously created his own Bible because he didn't like the Jesus of scripture and so he decided, he took six different versions of scripture and he took a razor blade and went through the Bible and cut out the parts he didn't like or agree with and then literally like collaged his own Bible back together to create a Jesus and a version of Christ that fit his desires. He liked the morals of Jesus, but he didn't believe in the miracles of Jesus. He liked the, the kindness of Jesus, but not the divinity of Jesus. And Thomas Jefferson did not like the high cost of following Jesus, so he just cut it out. And he made his own version of Jesus. That Bible is actually on display in museum today. It's the Thomas Jefferson Bible. You can Google it. That you would shake your head at that and go, who in the world would do that? All of us do that. All of us are wired to do that. We pick a version of him based on our culture, our likes, our dislikes, the things that we want to agree with or disagree. I've heard people say this. They go, I like Jesus. I like the teachings of Jesus, but I just don't like the rest of the New Testament or the Bible. Well, then you don't like the teachings of Jesus because he loved the Bible. He loved the Old Testament scripture. And Jesus said some really hard things. Have you ever known people that are like, you know, God knows my heart. And I like that Jesus doesn't judge me. Oh, he's gonna. Let's not get it twisted. He's gonna judge the whole world. People say all roads lead to Jesus. They do to the judgment seat of Jesus, but not salvation under God. 
I've heard people say things like, man, I, I, I like the teachings of Jesus, but I don't really care for the church. Well, you can't like me and hate my wife. And the bride of Christ is the church. Jesus has a bride and it's us. Hello, you're a beautiful bride, all of you, by the way. Honestly, we have so many views and versions of Jesus. I want today to have a Bible view of Jesus, who God has revealed himself to be. Let me show you why other religions actually affirm the reality of Jesus, but just not the truth of Jesus. So for example, you can write these notes down if you want. In fact, I encourage all of you. Judaism believes that Jesus was real, believes that Jesus existed, was a good teacher. He had miracles, had a crowd of disciples. He was respected, but he's not resurrected and he's certainly not God. In fact, when people say uh, Jews and Muslims and Christians all worship the same God, the problem with that is we worship Christ and we worship God, the Holy Spirit, and Jews and Muslims do not. So we don't actually worship the same God. Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet. They believe he was a teacher, that he was real. He was a nice guy, he was holy, he was wise. They believe he was divine because he became, he came into his divinity, but they do not believe that he was God eternal. Baha'i faith believes Jesus is holy, respected, wise, good teacher, good morals. They don't believe he's God. Hinduism, which is a religion of literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different gods, gods for all kinds of random things, they do believe Jesus was holy. They believe he had holiness put onto him. They believe he was wise. They believe he became a type of God or a God, lowercase g, not God forever and eternal. They believe Jesus was enlightened, that he'd come into his enlightened self, but they do not believe that Jesus is God forever. The New Age movement, which is popular in the West, especially in, the, uh, in, in Western civilization, it's kind of a spiritualist belief system rooted in all kinds of kind of Eastern mysticism and, and humanism is there. They believe Jesus was a good moral teacher. And again, anyone that says, I like the teachings of Jesus, but I don't wanna follow him, then you don't like the teachings of Jesus. <laughs> anyway, they believe he was wise. New Age people do not believe Jesus was God. Other faiths like Mormonism, and I know I'm gonna step on some toes here because a lot of Christians believe Mormonism is another denomination of Christianity. It is not. Mormonism actually teaches that God the Father had multiple wives and they were sexual. And God the Father and Holy Mother, the first uh, child born to God the Father and, and Holy Mother was Jesus, who was originally the archangel Michael, who, uh, excuse me, that's in uh, Jehovah's Witness faith. They, they believe Jesus was the spirit child of God the Father having sex with a Holy Mother. And he was the first child of God the Father and Mother and then later kind of came into his divinity. They also believe Satan was a stepchild, was a stepbrother of Jesus because God the Father uh, was intimate with another wife and had multiple children and one of them being sa Satan. So literally the Mormon faith believes Jesus is procreated of God, not God divin divine and eternal, and that he's a brother of Satan. This is problematic. By the way, the Mormon faith teaches it's a, another gospel, a revelation of the gospel to the Americas delivered by the angel Moroni. Paul says in Galatians, if any other gospel is ever presented by us or even an angel from heaven, let that messenger be accursed. So the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're, they're the ones that'll come to your house the most often. They believe Jesus was the first created being of God. So he's not equal to God. He's created by God and the first created being. He was originally the archangel Michael, then became Jesus, the son who became div divine in nature, but not eternally God. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses only believe in the father, but not God, the son and God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, secular humanism, which is not a religion in, in the sense that it has a God, but we are God. Uh, we believe, Je they believe Jesus is a moral teacher, wise, he was a nice guy, not raised from the dead, possibly not even crucified uh, as history suggests, and not God. Atheists believe Jesus is either not real or definitely not God. And then Christians say, and let me just say all roads do not go to God because none of these other roads believe Jesus is God. This is the exclusive truth claim of Christianity. And this is where I wanna spend the rest of our talk together. If I can do this in time, I'm gonna do my best. I promise you I'm gonna shout, I'm gonna get loud, animated, and it's all gonna be fun. I'd love to have your amens and your come ons and your stand ups and your, your waving a hanky. Come on, can I get an amen from everybody? Now listen, of course we believe the ascriptions that Jesus is good and wise and moral, he's a friend, he's our advocate, 
but more than the personality traits or the teaching motifs of Jesus, we exclusively have a truth claim about Jesus. And there's three things that I want you to see together as we follow out with these notes. And I'm gonna give you a lot of scripture today, so write them down. We, first of all, believe that Jesus is eternally God. He is God forever because the Bible teaches us that. Not because we've decided to make him this. Listen, I wanna start these three points of my message with the very first verse in your Bible. Very often, if you're gonna talk about Jesus, people go, well, let's go to the Gospels. Let's go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And I'm gonna give you a lot of scripture here to talk about the divinity of Christ, that he's God and he's always been God. He didn't become God. He didn't get God's dust sprinkled on him. He didn't come into himself. He was always God forever. Listen, Jesus is God eternal. And let me show you where this starts. We said we believe the Bible, it's alive and active. So start in your Bible in the first page, Genesis one, chapter one. Your Bible says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How many of you have heard this verse before? Now listen, when most Westerners think of this text, we think God the Father created the heavens and the earth. And Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you, God the Father created the heavens and the earth. We have this modalistic view of God, the Trinity. We think God the Father created it, God the Son fixed it, and God the Holy Spirit is the one who dwells in it now. That is an inappropriate and improper view, and it's actually been deemed a heresy for centuries. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So who created everything? God. Now, in the English, the word God is masculine, singular, proper noun. Okay, and we're gonna do a little grammar lesson here. Masculine, singer, singular, proper noun, capital letter. But in the original language that it was written, the word is not God, it was a word for God. In fact, the Old Testament has many names for God. Jehovah, Jehovah Yahweh, right? Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps. Jehovah, Jehovah Shalom, the God who brings me peace. Jehovah Tzidkenu, the God who makes me righteous. Jehovah Makedesh, the God who sets me apart. Uh, El, uh, El Elyon, there's all these different names for God in the Old Testament, but the first name of God given in the Bible is right here in Genesis 1. And if you go study this in the original language, you can do this on biblehub.com. You can see it in the original Hebrew. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. What is the word Elohim? We've, we've made it to be God because of editorial uh, efforts, but the word is Elohim. And Elohim is not a singular noun. It's actually a bigger word than that. It's, it's in the original language, it's the word that refers to the plural majesty of the Godhead. It's, you know how some words are singular and plural, like moose and moose? Come on, everybody. You knew that, right? You don't say mooses, do you? Come on. God is singular, but this word for God is plural and it's majestic. It's, it's actually a word that stands alone at the creation because of the plurality and the power and the majesty of the Godhead. It's a holy understanding of a majestic Godhead that we believe to be Trinity, triune. Now watch, I'm gonna show you what I mean by this. Skip on down 25 verses in your Bible. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created. And then verse 26, the same word, Elohim, appears. Then God said, and in your English it's singular, masculine, proper noun, but in the Hebrew it's plural, majestic plural. It's not God's, it's, it's God, it's one God, but it's plural majesty. Watch this. So it, then God, Elohim, said, let us. Now, that's bad grammar if it's singular. Let me would be if it's singular. But God's revealing something about himself here in Genesis 1, God, Elohim, said, let us make mankind in our image and in our Likeness. Do you see the plurality of majesty here in the very beginning of your Bible? It's really important that we set this foundation because we see at creation a plural majestic Godhead that's creating all things. And we're gonna see in a moment the confirmation that it was in fact Jesus present here. If you go on, you'll see in, in, in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth and the, 
spirit of God hovered over it, right? Then in verse 26, let us make mankind in our image. What's the image and likeness of God? God is Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit. Mankind is Trinity. We're body, soul, and spirit. And the likeness of God is we're in relationship. And how many of you know it's not good for people to be outside of relationship and we're to be loving and, and, and full of the spirit of God. And at first, they were made holy, just like God is holy. So we have this creation story of the Godhead, plural, majestic, creating mankind in our image, our likeness. God says, let us, who is us? It's the plural, majestic, triune, Godhead forever. It's important that you understand this is a massive distinction between every other world religion, especially any, quote, monotheistic religions like Judaism, Islam, or, or other singular, like Jehovah's Witness religions that say there's just God the Father. But we see from the beginning of text, there's actually... A, a, a majestic plurality of the Godhead. And Jesus is present there. And I wanna show you now the presence of Christ throughout the rest of scripture as God specifically. In Isaiah 9, verse six, we hear this every year at Christmas. The scripture says, this prophecy thousands of years before the birth of Jesus, for to us a child is born, a son is given. And he's completely talking about Jesus Christ here coming to, to be born of a Virgin Mary. And look what it says. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. Can I just tell you, this is not an American anthem verse. Like it's not the Republican party or the Democrat party. What he means is the authority to rule everything will be on him. Who has authority to rule everything? God and here Isaiah is saying in this son, God the son has the authority of God to rule over everything and his name shall be called wonderful counselor. What? Mighty Jesus is God. Everlasting father, prince of peace. Now move on with me in Matthew nine. I'm gonna go through these quickly. This is now Jesus in his ministry after his baptism in a river. Come on, today's the day. Getting into a boat, he crosses over and comes to his own hometown, right? His own city. And behold, some people had brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, how can you see the faith of a person if you're not God? Only he could read their minds, read their emotions and read their faith, right? Jesus seeing their faith says to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Let me just ask you, who has authority to forgive sin? Okay, is Jesus like just being super bold here and audacious? He's forgiving the sins of this paralyzed man. And then some scribes, look at this, some scribes, some of the, 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 the Jewish leaders of the day, they said, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, who can read the thoughts of a person besides God? He's not a psychic, he's not a palm reader, he's God. So look at this, Jesus has read the faith of the one man, now he's reading the thoughts of his critics because he's God, He's, I don't know if you find this interesting or not, but like his divinity is just sprinkled into the story about him. Do y'all see this right now? I'm so geeked out right now. And he says to them, he knowing their thoughts says, why do, you, why do you think evil in your heart? So Jesus can read your faith, he can read your mind, and now he can read your heart. Only God can do that, right? And then he says to them, this is such a flex. He said, well, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven because nobody can prove that or disprove it. He goes, which is easier? Just say, hey boy, you're forgiven or to say, rise and walk. Well, everybody standing there will be like, well, of course it's easier to say you're forgiven. <laughs> so then Jesus, just being a boss, says, so that you can know that I am the son of man and I have authority on earth to forgive sins because I'm God. He looks at the paralyzed guy and goes, go ahead and get up too. And he heals him. So he flexes his divinity. He knows their thoughts. He knows their faith. He knows their minds. He has the authority to forgive sins and he has the authority to do a miracle to raise him up from his paralyzed state and tell him to just go home. Only God can do that. In Matthew 28 about Jesus, it says, when they came to him, this is after his resurrection, they worshiped him. Who deserves our worship but God? And it even says some doubted, which I find really interesting. The disciples have watched their savior resurrect from the dead and they still doubt him. Let me just encourage all of you. If you still struggle with parts of doubt in your life, God can still use you and he's not mad about it. Just stay close to Jesus. Are you hearing me right now? Some of his disciples, they all worshiped him and some of them doubted him. And then it says, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Who has authority over everything? God, Jesus is, thank you. John 8, chapter 57. I'm just throwing a bunch of scriptures at you here about the divinity. Jesus is God forever. The Jews are challenging Jesus because he's just teaching and saying some things that they think is crazy. And then he said something about when he knew Abraham. 
Jesus says, he's 32. And he goes, yeah, back when I was with Abraham, you know, Mike's international version there, but he says, he, he quotes a story of his life with Abraham. And they said to him, the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham ever was, I am. Now, let me tell you what this, this will get you killed in a group of Pharisees. In fact, they, they got so angry at him for blasphemy, they pick up rocks to stone him and he does like Keanu Reeves' Matrix move. <sighs> and it says he walks right out from among them. He just escapes them. When you got a crowd of angry religious people trying to throw rocks at your head, the only way out is to be God and Matrix your way out of there. Y'all hear what I'm saying, everybody? Read it in your Bible. Romans chapter nine, the apostle Paul says, to them the Jews became belong all the patriarchs, the fathers of our faith, Noah, Abraham, Moses, etc. To the Jewish people are the patriarchs of the faith. And from their race, the Jewish faith, this is why Israel was so important, to bring us a Messiah, to bring us a Savior, to bring us Christ. From their race, according to the flesh, he was born of a woman, Mary, is the Christ, Jesus, who is what? God over all. Paul just explicitly says, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, and he is God over everything, blessed forever, amen. Colossians chapter one, this takes us back to the creation of Genesis chapter one that I quoted earlier. Paul writes of, of Jesus, he's the image of the invisible God. How many of you know we believe the Bible here? He is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. Watch this, talking about Jesus. By him, all things were created. In the beginning, God created Elohim. People say, well, that's just God the Father. No, no, no. Paul's telling us right here that by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Look at this. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Only God holds everything together. Look at this about Jesus. He's the head of the body, the church. Who's the head of the church? Who's the head of the church? Jesus, everybody say Jesus, who's the head of the church? He's God, look at this, he's the beginning, he's the firstborn from the dead, he's the first one ever raised from the dead. Who can defeat death except for God? He's the firstborn from the dead. In everything, we, he might be preeminent. For in him, look at this, for in him, Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He didn't just get a little God dust. He didn't just get a little bit of divinity. All the fullness of God dwells in Jesus. And through him, watch this, it's so brilliant. Through Jesus to reconcile to himself, he's the one that needs to be reconciled to all things, whether on earth or in heaven. He made peace for us through the blood of his own cross. Here's what God, here's how awesome Jesus is. God knows that the sins of the world separate people from him. God says they'll never pay for it. So God says, I'll pay for it. And so God has a demand for us to be forgiven. And then God says, I'll be the one that provides for their forgiveness. And then he offers himself on a bloody cross so that you and I can know the God who offers his salvation. There's so much that I could say about Jesus as God. If you wanna know more about Jesus as God, read your Bible and the gospels and Paul's writings in Hebrews 1, 13, 1 John chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and more. Revelation 22, verse 13, he says, I am the alpha and the omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. Listen, just some more for you, Mark 13, 26. Jesus is coming. I want you to understand, he's not a wuss. He's not political. He's not American. He's not a baby. He's not your homeboy. He is God forever. He's a big God. He's eternal. He's powerful. Mark 13 says he is coming again in the clouds with great power and great glory. He is coming again, not for a bunch of sellouts, not for a bunch of people that have decided who he is, but have committed to who he is. Listen, 1 Thessalonians 4 says, since we believe Jesus died and rose again, he will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God shall sound and the dead in Christ will rise with him. Revelation chapter one, I'm fired up, says this, Look at what he says about Jesus. He's not a passive 
Get out of jail free, just be your best self. Can't assist in Christ. He's not. He is a fiery God of heaven and he owns it all and he rules it all and he's a righteous judge and he's holy and he's good and he's a friend of sinners and he's full of grace and truth. He's not mad at you. He loves you deeply, but he cannot stand the sin that we abide in. So he gave his self as a sacrifice that we can be forgiven. We serve an eternal, big, mighty God. Revelation 3, 1 says this. John the Revelator says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, talking about Jesus. And when I turned to see him, he, I saw seven lampstands, which are the churches he's about to write to. And in the midst of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man. Look at this image, close your eyes and listen to me. I saw one standing like a son of man clothed with a long robe and golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were like white wool, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, his voice like the roar of mighty waters. In his right hand, he holds the seven churches and from his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, the word of God, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. I don't know what version of Jesus you've come to believe in, but I choose to believe the version the word of God tells us. He is a mighty God. He is an amazing, powerful, eternal God forever. And he is God forever. He didn't need you to believe in him to become eternal. We also believe he's Lord over everything. And I am fired up, fired up. I'm hot. Whew. I wanna be quick when I say this, the word Lord in the Old Testament is a word for God. When you read in the Bible in the Old Testament, they talk about the Lord, they're talking about God, it's a title for God and they've given that title to Jesus. And in the New Testament, Lord is not just a, a divine title, but it's also a word that means master, boss, like ruler, leader, how many of you know we love Jesus, the Savior? We don't like Jesus, the Lord. You know, as Americans especially, we hate kings. Like we started our country because we hate kings. We got the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the fifth gospel, the Constitution. <laughs> don't tell me what to do. Don't tread on me. Jesus says, no, I'll be your king. And he is Lord over all. He doesn't need your permission to do it either. To be Lord over the cosmos, he, he's Lord over the universe. He, his reign and rule extends beyond anything you can ever imagine. His rule is, is eternal. The angels are fully submitted to him. The heavens declare the glory of Jesus the Lord. I'm telling you, there ain't a single being in heaven and under in hell, there's no one that doesn't revere the lordship and the eternal authority of Jesus Christ. You know what the Bible says? If you and I won't worship, even the rocks will worship him because he's authority over all. Paul says it like this in Philippians 2. Am I yelling? I feel like I'm yelling. Whew. I need some water. My throat is parched. I'm a finish. Don't bring me any water. Tough it out. Like Terry Bradshaw. Okay. Paul says, therefore God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed upon him the name that's above every name. The name is above every name. It's over the name of every deity, every idol, every religion, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee in heaven, every knee on earth should bow, and every knee under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is Lord over everything. And I want you to understand, he's a patient Lord. He's a loving Lord. He's an open-handed inviting everyone to bow their knee to him, Lord. He's not asking you to believe in him and make him look like you. He's inviting you to believe in him and make you look like him. Second Peter 3, 9 says that he's not slow to return. Some people are like, I wish Jesus just returned and snapped me up out of here. But he's patient towards the church. Watch this, because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. We serve a good God who's Lord over everyone. Even lost people matter to Jesus. 
I want to tell every one of my Calvinist friends out there that believe Jesus only died for you. That just doesn't jive with scriptures. You got a version of Jesus on that screen that may look like some weird theology, but the Bible says he died for everyone that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. We're a hundred percent committed to believe that Jesus is God. He's God eternally. He was God before it all. He's God after it all. He's the same forever. And he's also Lord over all. He's the boss of it all. The devil actually isn't in charge. God, the son, the Lord, the father, the son, and the spirit, God is over everything. And every tongue will confess ultimately. Listen, we just want you to do it now. People say, well, I don't know that I want to, I'll just figure it out when I get to heaven. Too late. You will confess him as Lord, but I don't know that you'll get to be with him as Lord forever. We just want you to confess it now. That's why I can't wait. Today, I'm so fired up. We're going to baptize 250 people today of people who have said Jesus is Lord. All right, last thing. Stop clapping. You're slowing me down. Are y'all fired up over this church service today? Watch this. So he's God forever. He's Lord over everything. But the real question is, we believe Jesus is Lord over us. And this is where I want to end our time today with a bold question, a challenge. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, that sounded real country. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus is the same yesterday. He's the same today. He's the same forevermore. I want you to understand something. God was always, Jesus was always God forever. He's always going to be God He's eternal whether you believe in him or not. He's God no matter who believes in him, accepts him, crucifies him, or rejects him. But as big and eternal and great as he is, look at me, he's also Emmanuel. He's great, amazing, eternal God with us. He's an all-powerful, eternal God over everything. And he chooses to be a very present help in your time of trouble. He chose to come to us to make his dwelling with us, to be the sacrificial lamb to pay for the sins that he required of us. He lived a perfect sinless life, died on a cruel Roman cross for the express purpose of paying for our sins. He was buried, raised from the dead, proving he's God. And listen to this, he invites all people for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus to his disciples asked this question I'm asking you today. I wanna put that picture back up on the LED wall. Jesus asking his disciples, who do people say I am? Some think you're Elijah, some think you're a prophet, some think you're a wise teacher, some think you're the son of God who became the birth child of God and his wife. Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? Church, I'm gonna tell you, this is the question I have for you today. You don't get to pick a version of Jesus. That's what our world is doing. That's what culture is doing. That's what other religions have done. Who do we say that he is? And I just choose to say, man, you are who you said you are. You are God everlasting. You, you are the, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are eternal. You are the creator. You're the God who gives me grace and truth and salvation. I want you to understand something. He was already all these things before you were ever born. He is still all these things in spite of your convictions and belief. He's still Lord over heaven and earth, even if you reject him. But who do you say that he is? Who is Jesus in your life? Is he homeboy? Is he your political persuasion? Is he the non-judgmental accept you as you are? Or is he boss, master, savior, Lord, ruler, king, highest affection, of your life. He's God without you, but desperately wants to be God over you. He's Lord over all and wants to be Lord over you. So have you believed that? Have you accepted that you serve the great God, Jehovah God, God, the father, God, the son, God, the spirit. Have you accepted it and received that into your life? And listen, have you surrendered to Jesus as the Lord of all of your life? I'll close with this scripture Jesus said in John 14. You've heard it, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Let me unpack that, what he means. He says, I'm the only way to God. 
I am the full truth of God. I'm the only one that gives eternal life under God. He said, no one comes to the Father, but through me. Who do you say Jesus is? Can we stand to our feet around this room? I wanna close this in prayer. We like to say that we exist to lead people to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. Not a version of Jesus, not a worldview of Jesus, not another religious expression of Jesus. We exist to follow Christ. Can everyone stay in the room for two more minutes, please? Can you open your hands to the Lord with me? Come on, everyone around the room. Say, God, I thank you so much for your word. Come on, pray this with me. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Father God, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit to die for my sin, to raise from the dead, to give me eternal life that I may know God, find freedom and live for you for the rest of my life. Say, I believe in Jesus Christ, the son of the living God who died for me and raised from the dead to be my master, my savior, my Lord, my boss. I surrender all to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for changing my life. Thank you, Lord, for changing my life. Thank you, Lord, for changing my life. God, today we desire to be renovated. We desire that our lives be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we pray in Jesus' name that we would never be the same because of the work that you've done in us today because of the preached word of God. And we submit to you today as Lord and Savior over all. You are the eternal God. You are God over everything. And Lord, today we submit that you are God over us. We give you our whole lives. We repent of our sin We receive your forgiveness and we accept your salvation that only comes through Jesus, the only way to God, to God be the glory. Can you just take a moment and just tell the Lord how grateful you are. Come on, thank the Lord for his goodness. Thank the Lord for his faithfulness to you. Thank the Lord for his salvation. Thank the Lord that he's eternal and he's big and he's great and he's with you today in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to our message. My prayer for you is that you've been inspired and challenged by the message and also moved in your devotion to Jesus. If you'd like to grow in your walk with Jesus Christ, stay connected or even partner with us through generosity, please be sure to visit our website at lifepointchurch.tv. We hope you have a blessed week and we will see you next Sunday.